Welcome to the 2020 Commonwealth Honors College Plenary Lecture. I am excited we are able to continue this Honors College tradition of inviting thought leaders from across the spectrum of UMass Amherst faculty to present ideas and research that have interdisciplinary implications. The 2020 plenary lecture titled, Is Racism a Science Problem? is presented by Scott Auerbach, a professor of chemistry and chemical engineering, whose interest in the link between science and human diversity stems from his role as the founding director of the UMass ICONS program, which teaches STEM field undergraduates to use human diversity as a problem solving tool by honing advanced communication and collaboration skills. Professor Auerbach's investigation into the connection between science and racism is relatively new. And just as the honors experience encourages students to think critically and explore profound ideas, he is examining the link between science and racism using empirical as well as anecdotal evidence. He is delighted to share his findings and discussing this important issue with a special guest, Roderick Anderson, the president of Pioneer Valley Coral and Natural Science Institute. Roderick Anderson's unique experience brings together firsthand knowledge and practical experiences that engage complex issues at the regional and international levels. He forewent completing his PhD at UMass Amherst in the Department of Anthropology in order to launch the Institute. His dissertation research as a social cultural anthropologist focuses on Afro-American civic leadership, civil society, social movement theory, critical theory, political economy, and the African diaspora. I hope this presentation will inspire you to think critically about the question posed by Professor Auerbach, and I encourage you to explore your ideas and expand your own creative potential, and ultimately to transform your knowledge into effective and creative actions. Enjoy the lecture. Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to the uh, plenary lecture of the Commonwealth Honors College. My name is Scott Auerbach, and I'd like to thank Dean Castaneda for her kind introduction. Obviously, I'm humbled by the opportunity to give this talk. I'm also humbled by the faith to be able to speak on this topic, so important, and I'm really grateful to be able to share this time with my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Rod Anderson. Yeah. Hey. Thanks, Scott, and thank you, uh, Dean Castaneda, for this opportunity to speak on such an important and pressing issue. Yeah, okay, so let's get started. Uh, we've got a lot to cover here. We've got about um, three hours worth of material that we're gonna pack into about 50 minutes. Um, so here's the question, is racism a science problem? It's a loaded question, and Rod, I can think of at least four different ways to unpack this. Has science contributed to racist thought? We're going to see the answer is yes. Has racism negatively impacted science? Again, we're going to see the answer is yes. Is racism the kind of problem that can be addressed by science in the form of social science? Absolutely. And last, can racism be solved by natural science? That one is less obvious, but I have a feeling that you're going to say the answer is yes. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I agree that the answer is yes to all of those, those questions. Yeah. And there's any number of ways, as you said, and then we could spend at least three to 24 hours in a long <laughs> on, yeah. on this dynamic and how we could address these problems. Yep. Yeah. So for the student, for the students listening, they are probably wondering, why are we talking about this now? Why is a white chemist talking about this? And why is a black business leader talking about this? So I think before we get into the meat of the subject, I think we should uh, sort of come clean on sort of who we are and why are we talking about this now? So part one, I think both you and I have had our own kind of uh, epiphany. And I think it would be good to share that. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, if it's okay with you, Rod, I'm gonna start with you. But before you actually start, um, I'm going to play an introduction song that I know is near and dear to your heart. And I have it hooked up so that the recording will hear it as well. Are you ready? I am. I am. I think you're going to play one of my favorite songs.
Yes. Rolling yeah. Stones. Rolling Stones, my friend. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to do that. I'm going to move it over to the next one because I have my own introduction song as well. I'm going to ask you, Rod, to talk through the epiphany that you had. Yeah. My, my epiphany comes out of the course of doing and working on my dissertation research and looking at issues of of African American and Puerto Rican civil society and economic development or the role of economic uh, development uh, impact on African American and Puerto Rican civil society here in New England. Um, looking at the ways in which science and scientific research in particular uh, have marginalized and, and left out the experience of so many uh, Black and Latinos uh, generally, uh, when it comes to development and educational access, um, is particularly what I'm referring to when I'm talking about uh, uh, civil society and the institutional mm. aspects of, of, of community that are 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 ultimately inter interrelated, uh, but are systemically gone have systemically gone unaddressed. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with this and, and what my, my epiphany was is that we can actually address these issues. You know, and I was fortunate enough uh, during the course of my dissertation research to come across some developers and other uh, business leaders around the state that wanted to address these issues and, and, and help provided me uh, with resources to actually do something about this. So, yeah. So how long ago did that happen? What sort of, uh, was it a year, five years? Um, so I won't get into how long it was taking me to finish my dissertation. Okay. Uh, yeah. PhD advisor would, would get on me and, mm -hmm. and, and be upset with me for not, uh, ultimately finishing my dissertation. But, um, about three and a half years ago, mm. uh, I had moved out to Boston. I had finished uh, doing a teaching stint, a visiting uh, lecturer position at uh, Trinity College and uh, uh, teaching part-time at Central Connecticut State University. Mm -hmm. uh, and my, my partner and, and girlfriend was running the, the labs at Northeastern and I was still driving out here to Amherst and doing my uh, my, my field work and, and interviews when the opportunity presented itself by one of the, the local developers to uh, mm -hmm. want to support to actually uh, address this issue. So great. And yeah, I received some uh, grant funding and uh, friends and family, the community stepped up to help uh, contribute to us creating our research institute, Pioneer Valley Coral mm -hmm. and Natural Science Institute. Yep. Um, so we got that so, off. So that's about three and a half. About so actually, so it, it goes from the actual putting the concept together on paper mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. then. So about two and a half years ago, we actually started an institute and incorporated and all that. So about got two it. and a half. Years. Yeah. Great, great, great. So we're actually going to hear a lot more about both the Pioneer Valley Coral Natural Science uh, Institute and your company Elatech later on in mm -hmm. in in the talk. So thank you, Rod, yeah. for, for sharing that. Okay, so now I, I have to share. Uh, mm -hmm. But before that, I've got my own introduction song. So here we go. Nice. Thank you. You had to, to one-up me on the, the Marvin Gaye. <laughs> oh, you can't one-up the Stones, though. But Marvin Gaye is, <laughs> Marvin Gaye slaps. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's it right there. All right. And uh, so bringing it back. So here's my story. I'm going to get back to uh, the laser pointer. 
So my story, I think about it from passive to anti-racist. And this all is about what happened to George Floyd, May 25th, 2020. Um, and not only that, but the uh, responses to the Black Lives Matter demonstrations across the, uh, the country, the militarized you know, responses, I felt like I was shaken. Um, I was uh, shaken awake. And so what I realized was previously I was uh, ignorant of the nature of uh, systemic racism. Of course, I knew about racism, but I didn't really know about racism. And uh, what I'm doing now is I'm trying to build knowledge about my own identity, uh, about whiteness and implicit bias. And my mission is about the ICONS program. The UMass ICONS program is increasing its diversity, equity, and inclusion because that's core, that's essential. And we're gonna hear more about that later as well. And um, Rod, if it's okay, I'd like to spend a couple more slides to tell the mm -hmm. story to, to unpack yeah. this. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, uh, I, I did some reading um, and I also watched some films. I basically tried to do some work to learn about myself and learn about the world. And this is, by the way, my prompt to say that although this talk is focusing on science and social science and natural science, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, the humanities and fine arts are massively important for telling the story about race and racism, whether it's literature, poetry, whether it's music, film, whether it's two-dimensional art, three-dimensional art, there's a virtual art exhibit happening in the Fine Arts Museum right now telling the story about, uh, about people of color. And so, but the focus of this talk is about the natural and the social sciences. And so we're gonna launch there. After doing this work, at first I felt a little bit like this. I was getting all these new uh, ideas to me that were feeling new and I wanted to put them, I wanted to make some sense out of them. So if it's okay, I just wanted to share, I'm very visual. So, oh, and I have to say, I have to say thank you to my uh, mentors along this journey. Uju is one of the world's experts in implicit bias. Linda has been an incredible advisor. Ali is uh, 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 taking over the role of uh, diversity advisor. And Elizabeth Connor has always been a, a great mentor for me. So I just want to thank these folks for their role. But what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to show, and this is kind of from a physical chemist standpoint, I want to show kind of visually what I was thinking before this epiphany and what I'm thinking now. Um, yeah. so, so before I had this idea, what this is, what I'm doing is I'm basically breaking society into three pieces. I imagine there are some actively anti-racist people uh, there are some actively racist people, people who are intentionally, you know, thinking and speaking and acting in a racist way. And then there's something like a passive middle. And what I tried to do is I tried to come up with, because I'm a, a computational chemist, I tried to come up with a sort of a calculus of, of, of racism almost. So I imagine that everybody's like a little magnet. And when you have two opposite magnets, they cancel. When you have two aligned magnets, they reinforce. So the folks who are actively anti-racist, not all their magnets are pointing the same direction, but they're more or less pointing and they add up to a significant magnet right here. Uh, and I gotta change this over here. I gotta move this so that we can see all the magnets. And then on this side, there's also magnets and then there's a big magnet there. And then here's the big mistake that I made, Rod was mm -hmm. that I imagined that the middle, that the magnets basically canceled. That people mm -hmm. were, that there were some folks who, um, you know, sometimes they were acting in a racist way, sometimes in an anti-racist way, but in general, the middle kind of canceled. And let me tell you, that is so very wrong because what I wasn't thinking about, because I didn't really deeply understand it, was implicit bias, which is this kind of invisible, fuel that powers the engine of institutional racism. And that institutional racism has to come from, from the middle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the, as a chemist, I could see how you would look at the molecules and thinking, mm -hmm. you know, along those lines, but, you know. Yeah, so let me show you what I'm thinking now. It's actually, the, the picture is not dramatically different. We still have 
anti-racist activists on the right and racists, in a sense, activists, uh, sorry, on the anti-racist activists on the left and uh, actively racist people on the right. But in the middle, I now think of it not passive, but passive, passively racist. And this is where I was. I was passively racist. And in a sense, I still am because of my socialization. But the point is, is that all these magnets here, while they're pointing in a bunch of different directions, they're all tipping a little bit to the right. And this is this sort of implicit bias and systemic racism. And so yeah. what I now realize in a sense is that the biggest arrow here, in the past I thought the big arrows were here and here, but I realize now the biggest arrow is that one there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they enable systemic and structural racism to continue through their silence in a lot of ways there, yeah. Or, yeah. So. yeah, and it's interesting to wonder, I mean, you know, you're, you're trying to build sustainable um, kind of organizations that support anti-racist work in STEM. And it's this mm -hmm. issue of uh, sustainability. And obviously, um, implicit bias, it's interesting to wonder about the psychology of implicit bias, because implicit bias seems to tip these arrows to the right. Wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to make implicit bias tip these arrows to the left? Yeah, it would be, be wonderful to get more folks to actively participate in, in fighting structural and institutional racism and, and ending white supremacy. I mean, as America has evolved, you know, since its founding, I mean, it's been a continual struggle and, and it's going to be there, unfortunately, I think, until after we're gone you know um but as long as we're all doing our part to to change and make the country better and, and make our our lives uh better i think these things can change you mm -hmm. know and but it takes Act us yeah. actively doing so i mean it, it takes active participation and and yeah. uh histories of of racism discrimination marginalization oppression and what have you on uh on an individual level and then actual changing structures and institutions of, of, of science and then of society as well to make things better. Yeah. 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 So, um, so to kind of summarize my epiphany, I'm going to actually mm -hmm. quote from this book, White Fragility, written by Robin uh, D'Angelo. And her page 69 really spoke to me. She spoke about the white racial frame. She, uh, this is her speaking about herself, but I feel like it could be me speaking about my own self. And she writes, quote, my psychosocial development was inculcated in a white supremacist culture in which I, because she's white, am in the superior group. Telling me to treat everyone the same is not enough to override this uh, uh, socialization, nor is it humanly possible. So she's really speaking about the battle between free will and socialization, mm -hmm. you know? So then yeah. she goes on to say, and this is her speaking about allyship is on the same page. Now it's our uh, responsibility. And I think when she says our, she means the responsibility of white people to grapple with how this socialization manifests itself in our daily lives and how it shapes our actions. And so this is basically, this is uh, the epiphany that I had in my effort to try to swing my um, little magnet from the right to the left. So anyway, with, with that said, let's now launch into the meat of the, the topic and let's get right to it. Um, let's ask the question, has science contributed to racist thought? And the short answer is, you betcha. And it's called scientific racism. And um, there's basically three, there, I mean, there's a lot of ideas, um, all of them wrong, um, but there's three big ones. One is that whites are superior. People had thought that they had actually scientifically proved that, that race is based in genetics and that eugenics is good for society. Of course, we all know that these are wrong, that humans are equal in principle. If they appear different, 
it's because of their social um, and econ the social economic context in which they're in, that in, uh, race is a social construct, it's not based in genetics, and that eugenics harms society because it decreases human diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, Rod, if uh, like when you were an anthropology student, did you talk about scientific racism at all? Is that something that, you know, comes up? Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, one of the, the most influential books, uh, one of the best books I, I, I come across was uh, Jonathan Mark's uh, piece on human diversity and looking at how science as a educational uh, uh, component really defined how we were able to able to categorize people and structure and justify racial categories and relationships, uh, but also uh, gender relationships. So, I mean, that was a major aspect of, of our educational uh, experience and development and, and research as uh, I was studying anthropology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so what I wanted to show right now is um, sort of uh, uh, what I threw together from my research is a sort of a timeline of sci scientific racism. And it, you know, some would say it goes back to Aristotle and the great chain of being. Um, but I would actually start it with uh, Linnaeus in 1735 when he actually published an association between skin color and behavior. And unfortunately, in the timeline, I would argue that it uh, actually continues to today. There's actually a scientific journal that is sort of maintains, you know, carries the torch of scientific racism even today. Mm -hmm. But I would yeah. ask you, Rod, what do you think, if you could, if, if there's something missing, if there's something that you would feel like add, subtract, or change to this, what would you say? And these are our, our key dates in the development of science, uh, natural sciences as a discipline. Um, from Linnaeus to uh, Samuel Morton, I mean, these are all key and pivotal dates that really have re reflect the backbone of scientific racism. Um, I mean, there's obviously there's many, many more that you will potentially yeah. uh, put in there, uh, but this does represent the backbone of scientific racism and has led up to today. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my research about scientific racism, it was incredibly difficult to find science during this period that wasn't scientifically racist. Right, right. And it's gendered. just and gendered. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, here, here we are. And I feel like, Rod, I want to spend a little time on this issue about race as a social construct. And the reason mm -hmm. why is that I actually never really learned this. I never learned the background in terms of what was the science, what were the questions, how to think about it, until I started doing research for this talk this summer. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I, I can't let this slip through the cracks. So I want to spend a little time on it. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I know that was one of the reasons why I wanted to participate in this talk with you. That's you know, when we had talked, you were telling me about it. You yeah. Know, I, yeah, it was a fascinating story of your, your growth and experience. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take a little divergence into human uh, population genetics. The uh, concept of a gene pool associated with a population, the concept of a width of a gene pool. And in order to breathe life into that idea, I want to show a picture. And there's going to be two cases, case one and case two. So for case one, so this would be what the picture would look like if it were true that race is based on genetics. Now, I want to be clear, it turns out it's not true. But this is uh, when we do science, we consider lots of different scenarios. So this is a case where imagine we have different populations, call them race one, two, and three. And we have different gene pools, uh, green, blue, and red. Each pool has a width characterized by a certain 
number W and these, there is sort of a, a distance or a difference between these pools characterized by another number uh, D. And in this picture, D is much larger than W. Now the opposite case where W is much larger than D is shown here. So in this case, basically what happens is the gene pools are so broad, they're overlapping, they're basically the same pool and they're indistinguishable. And in that case, we would say that actually race is not based at all in genetics, it's a social construct. So here are the two extremes. Yeah. And the fascinating thing is it wasn't until 1972. Now, of course, okay, so I should be clear that there is a lot of work done on this about uh, uh, blood types, especially after World War I, um, where people had claimed that, and they, uh, so this is part of the history of sci scientific racism, to claim that yes, race is based in genetics. But it wasn't until 1972 that what we considered the authoritative study was done using, uh, at that time, the newly developed techniques in uh, 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 molecular biology. And um, mm -hmm. so here's, here's the paper and yep. the drum roll, please. I just did a little drum yep. roll. And yep. here's yep. the answer. The answer is case two. Case two, and in fact, I made these arrows to scale with these numbers that the width is eight times bigger than the difference, that gene pools from different races are basically indistinguishable, that they're so dramatically overlapping that the yeah. take home message is that race is a social construct. Right, yeah, no, definitely it is. I mean, there's so little difference between folks and, you know, as you said, it's more, you're more likely to find that the numbers bear out that it's uh, blood type that distinguishes yeah. people than phenotype. Yeah, exactly. So, so now some would argue that the techniques in 1972 were still pretty primitive. And when you read this paper, there's a few assumptions that have to be made. So this work was um, checked and checked and checked again. And so here's an example, 2002, again, looking at this, asking about the patterns of human diversity and what they found is shown here. So this was the old result, 72. Here's the new result. So they have maybe more significant digits, but the take home message is quite the same, is race is a social construct. Mm -hmm. um, and that is now what we call settled, settled science. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I have to say when I read Lewinton's paper, I was troubled by something in it. I mean, Lewinton, obviously, this is an incredibly important piece of work, but I want to show you the last couple paragraphs here. So mm -hmm. he says, um, it is clear that our perception of relatively large differences between human races is a biased perception and that human races and populations are remarkably uh, uh, similar. And I think that's basically what you, you just said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then yeah. he goes on to say, and this, I was really interested by this, he then goes on to say, and this is the highlighted in red, human racial classification is of no social value. I mean, I can totally understand why he says it's of no scientific value, but he says it's of no social value and no justification can be offered for its uh, uh, continuance. And then I realized what he was basically saying is let's ignore Let's start ignoring race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's colorblind. Yeah. Exactly. And that yeah. actually is a slippery slope because it now gives license for people to do what's called uh, uh, gaslighting by saying, let's, let's ignore race. And that became very popular after uh, uh, Barack Obama was elected president. People said, we can now officially ignore race. And what's the problem of ignoring race? Yeah, I mean, you, obviously you miss the social consequences of that history of, of structural institutional racism that's supported you know, white supremacy. So you, you completely sidestep all the contemporary issues and the historical experiences of millions and millions of people here in the US and around the world. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, um, so the bottom line is if you ignore race, you have given yourself license to 
ignore racism. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder if this one innocent little sentence at the end of this landmark paper actually gives scientific fuel for that. Yeah, I, it gives, gives folks a way out, you know? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I think the take home message is that we scientists have to stay in our lane. We can talk about scientific value, but we probably shouldn't talk about uh, 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 social value. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, science exists within a society, right? So I, I think we'll get to this a little bit later, but I think you are, you'll be able to speak to this more about some of the work that you've been doing outside mm -hmm. of uh, your, your research as a chemist, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So have our, our roles to play, so to speak. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So I'd like to pivot now to the second um, aspect of this is racism a science problem. And, and I just, in, in your experience, in your lived experience, Rod, in your professional experience, how has racism manifested as a science problem in your work? Oh, man, and from my direct experiences of dealing with uh, racist uh, colleagues to, you know, racist uh, faculty when I was taking uh, my, my, my courses, um, and there, there's so many ways, you know, as an mm -hmm. African-American person whose family actually goes back to the 1820s in these United States, um, mm -hmm. there's uh, uh, any number of, of daily experiences of, of racism um, that I've actually uh, witnessed. But then in terms of my current work and what we're doing now, um, it's about looking at the actual structural pieces that reinforce uh, marginalization and, and white supremacy within the entrepreneurship circle, um, educational access, um, things of that nature. Uh, you know, when I, myself and uh, my, my, my partner and uh, girlfriend, when we started Pioneer Valley Coral and Natural Science Institute, um, she had been working at Northeastern, running uh, research labs there and doing community outreach in Roxbury and the greater Boston area. And I've been doing my research uh, primarily uh, out here in Western Mass and down in, uh, in Connecticut, you know, mm -hmm. and they're talking with people about educational access and research, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the STEMs, because that's with really uh, a, a lens I hadn't looked at. Uh, before or through from, uh, from, from Lily, it was really stark at seeing how many people did not see African-American and, and Puerto Ricans or Black and Latinos uh, in, the, in, in the U.S. as being so marginalized and, mm. and, and discriminated against when it came to uh, providing them access to uh, really strong STEM education. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I don't want to call any organizations out or, or yeah. any individual yeah. pull out, but, you know, they know who they are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope, uh, but yeah, I hope, hope they know who they are. Yeah. Oh, well, no, I also called them out to their face, you know, and so they know. Okay. They know, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've done that. You know. mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a really complex and complicated uh, issue that we all have to do our part to really try and address, you know? Yeah, so, right. Yeah. Well, That's so why, there's... Why I was excited about doing this talk with you. you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, so, yeah, so there's... Uh, I, I found this uh, research study from uh, Pew that totally backs up everything that you, you know, just said. I mean, when we look at some of these numbers, um, so this is a study that was published in 2000. And 18, mm -hmm. and it comes from STEM workforce data from 2014 to 2016. This is what it looks like. So um, mm -hmm. this is uh, basically the entire workforce. This break up into uh, they broke it up into whites, Asians, blacks, Hispanics. So this is the STEM workforce here. And it's mm -hmm. clear that whites are overrepresented, Asians are strongly overrepresented, blacks and Hispanics underrepresented. 
And when you break it up into the individual sectors of the STEM, by the way, for those of you who don't know, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and, and math. It's become so uh, marbled into our sort of lexicon that I forgot to say what that means. So that's what that is, science, technology, engineering, and math. And so when you break that up into the various subfields, you see just how underrepresented those folks are. And that's totally backing up what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it's even worse though. The story gets worse when we look at uh, the fact that even if they do get jobs, they're, they're underpaid. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We know, yeah. for example, women are getting something like 77 cents to the dollar compared to men in mm -hmm. general. Uh, Black people in the workforce are getting um, overall 73 cents to the dollar compared to whites. The good news is, is that black people in STEM, it's not that bad, but they're still getting underpaid. And the right. really bad news is the discrimination numbers, that uh, blacks are the most likely to experience uh, uh, discrimination. And in fact, most black people in the STEM workforce do experience that. So that's mm -hmm. totally, you know, jiving with what you're saying about your experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being now considered a, a black uh, or African American CEO of a tech company, um, yeah, I, I could tell you the number of uh, events I participated in where a couple hundred people, and I'm the only only uh, brown face in the room. Mm. You know, so yeah, yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in, at the C-suite level. I mean, you have a lot of, of Asian, South Asian uh, yeah. women you know, within the workforce, but at the C-suite level, you know, there is no diversity, mm -hmm. no diversity. You yeah. know, um, even in terms of uh, funding for entrepreneurs, um, there was a study that came out, uh, I believe it was in uh, Bloomberg uh, recently and uh, put out through uh, Pitchbook, uh, which is a, a national uh, database for uh, investors and entrepreneurs to participate in, like one percent of the investor capital that went to uh, entrepreneurs and startup companies went to black-led companies. One percent. One percent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's a whole mm -hmm. different notion of the one, one, one percenter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's incredible. Yeah. yeah, that is. That's incredible. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, explicitly what you and your partner are doing at the Pioneer Valley Coral Natural Science Institute. Well, the institute, the idea of the institute uh, really emerged out of conversations and interviews I have been doing as a part of my uh, field work for my dissertation. Mm -hmm. where I was uh, community leaders, uh, business leaders, and looking at how do you, or how can we understand the dynamics around African American and Puerto Rican experiences in uh, civil society and and development and their underrepresentation and a lot of the decision making that impacts their communities. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, as Lily and I uh, were talking about my research we were trying to figure out a way of actually addressing the issue. You know, I mean, it was all kind of uh, theoretical at the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And then I um, came across a developer, a business leader that wanted to su support me, even though it was outside of uh, his area of, mm -hmm. uh, of work, you know, and he, he helped me develop our, our model for the Institute mm -hmm. and, helped us reach out to folks to get all the initial funding and, and, mm -hmm. and help sponsor us with uh, different events. And, you know, it, it, it really became this opportunity where it's like, wow, I, I no longer have to talk about racial uh, marginalization and discrimination. Like we can actually build an institute. I could actually build an institute wow. of Lily to actually address these issues. Yeah. Um, so given Lily's background as a, a chemist and a researcher, mm -hmm. she's already you know, had been doing uh, educational outreach uh, in the greater Boston area, we were able to develop a program that allowed mm -hmm. her to bring her skill set and, and experiences 
to kids in, in Holyoke and, uh, and uh, greater Amherst area where mm -hmm. we could directly provide programs to these uh, Black and Latino communities and then also mm -hmm. communities in South Hadley. So we're uh, one of the lead educational partners for uh, Holyoke uh, Public High Schools and mm -hmm. we'd uh, become a partner before the pandemic with uh, South Hadley High School and providing yeah oral touch tanks and educational programming to them and you know we're really looking forward to working with uh Holyoke High School and getting that program mm -hmm. off the ground to provide uh capstone course uh facilities for wow. those who be able to come and actually work in the labs and things of that nature and yeah yeah fortunately that's cool you know but yeah I mean that's kind of the work what we've been doing uh so I gotta this. ask yeah I I got to ask, I'm fascinated by coral. I mean, coral seems to be sort of like a central, like, you know, the, the linchpin. So why coral? Well, coral uh, came out of my experience as a, as a reef hobbyist, as an Aquarius. You know, mm -hmm. I've been a long, lifelong Aquarius where I've had aquariums in, in, in the house since I was, you know, five years old, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so. I understood the, the delicate nature of the ecosystems and the water chemistry that is needed to support the marine life and then also to even be able to grow coral. Um, and with Lily, again, as her background in chemistry, it really lent itself to uh, be able to teach kids environmental engineering, bio, and chemistry through right. engaging and, and colorful and hands-on way with, uh, with, with the coral and the fish, you know, there's really... Yeah excited the kids and you know they're like wow they wanted their own reef tanks and you know a lot of parents were were upset because they're like you know how much that costs now my <laughs> my daughter my son wants yeah. you know, a coral tank uh, you know salt right. water you know especially yeah. with popularity of dora and uh, mm -hmm. uh nemo and you know nemo mm -hmm. and dora mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah so so um is there like an economic connection? I mean, did you actually, was coral part of like the business model? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was about also promoting sustainability in the reef hobby industry, mm -hmm. right? You know, so that folks would no longer have to just do direct shipments from the ocean. You know, we would yeah. have a coral farm where we would grow out the coral and then provide uh, regional uh, pet stores with mm -hmm. uh, pieces of those corals that we've been growing out in our facility. So that was one way we were looking at the funding model for the institute to create a self-sustaining institute uh, for ongoing education. So we wouldn't be reliant on, on grant funding. You know? Got it. That's so, fascinating. So it's the other side of our, our model was to mm -hmm. promote researchers and uh, entrepreneurship within mm -hmm. the institute by subsidizing those researchers that are using the utilizing the facilities to do their early stage proof of concept, and then ex in exchange they would do educational programming with wow. the high school. So yeah. that's the the model that we had with the institute. So that's to interesting. So in addition to the coral ecosystem, you mm -hmm. had a sort of an entrepreneurial educational sort of ecosystem spinning as well. Right. Exactly. Fascinating. Exactly. Fascinating. Well, mm -hmm. so like you, I'm, um, I am committed to addressing mm -hmm. the STEM uh, diversity problem. And right. so I took a different approach with the ICONS program. And I am uh, physically not able to get through a talk without giving a little short pitch about the ICONS program. Oh, so, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I wanted to, to hear, I was going to be asking you that about yeah. you know, what you guys cool. have been doing. Cool. Okay, and just as a, uh, a trigger alert, the background is going to change, you know, dramatically. So don't be surprised if you see a big change in background. And here it is. So okay, there's okay. the ICONS program. So ICONS is a program at UMass, stands for Integrated Concentration in Science. It's a certificate in real world problem solving. And, you know, it's, a, it's an effort to bring these big problems in energy, medicine, food, water, and climate into the undergraduate STEM program, but with a radically different way of teaching science. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we launched ICONS was 
you know, with uncertainty and access to clean energy, uncertainty in the state of the climate, access to water, uncertainty about, you know, disease, cancer. We didn't, I mean, obviously we didn't know about COVID when we launched ICONS in the year 2010. But uh, what was keeping me up at night, Rod, was I wasn't sure that we were training students. You know, I mean, they're so, we often train students to be so narrow in their fields that they may not be able to actually address these big problems. Mm -hmm. You know, so yes. what we did was we, um, we thought that an interdisciplinary approach where if you're working, it doesn't matter what problem you're working on, if it's a big societal problem, you probably need a range of different disciplines. So it could be, you know, engineering or life science, physical science, geoscience, whatever, food science, you know, psychology, whatever. Um, you need a diverse team of students working on today's big problems. So what we found was that we had a STEM program that actually not only valued, you know, diversity, but actually relies on uh, diversity. And it's not only the diversity of, say, the majors of the students in the room, but human diversity writ large, you know, uh, gender, ethnic, cultural. We need all possible perspectives to be able to create the kinds of teams that can, you know, address these issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's yeah. kind of the icons story. And I just have to throw in here for the students who are listening, who are thinking about applying to icons, please consider applying. And I got to remind you, the application is due on October 13th. <laughs> <laughs> the nice plug. The that's, nice a, plug. that's a plug. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, so what else have uh, icons been doing in terms of diversity and inclusion? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. And what we learned, Rod, is that uh, just by saying that we value diversity doesn't mean that we're going to get a diverse student body. And what we learned after about five years was that if we build it, they won't necessarily come. And so mm -hmm. what we needed to do, in, it, in addition to having a program that gives students the freedom. So if, uh, and later we'll see there's a biology student who graduated ICONS in 2018 who wanted to study race-based uh, 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 medicine. And so mm -hmm. that was her passion and she had the opportunity, the freedom and icons to study that. But to really get a diverse student body, we needed to do two more things. We needed to go out and recruit through mm -hmm. uh, the Emerging Scholars Program of the Commonwealth Honors College, through the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Mi Minority uh, uh, Participation, through a mm -hmm. variety of other programs. And we needed to worry about the inclusiveness of the icons experience as well. And that's something that we're working hard on now. So those are two pieces that we had to add. Uh, great, great. I'm good to, and glad to hear that. Um, yeah. the, the Emerging Scholars Program, when I was uh, still working on my dissertation uh, there at UMass was one of the programs that I had wrote, uh, wrote up and mm -hmm. put together with one of the former uh, provosts, uh, Charlene Seymour, and then uh, Associate Chancellor Esther Terry, and then mm -hmm. Dean of Honors College, uh, Linda Slapey. Um, so I worked with them closely in uh, writing the outline for the Emerging Scholars Program. So gotcha. it's great to be able to uh, yeah. work with them and working with them. And hopefully um, uh, Dean Consonetta continue mm -hmm. that, that, that piece, you know. And yeah. through, through my company, I think, uh, and, and Institute, you know, we're definitely wanting to try and support both icons and emerging scholars in, in, in the future. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. So continuing with the talk, we're now on the third question. Can racism be solved by social science? And I think you and I, obviously, we both agree the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And you know who I have to show right now, Rod. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you know who's coming. The legend. The legend. W. Yeah. E. E.B. Du Bois was actually born not too far from here. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we've named the library on campus after him. Mm -hmm. um, he is regarded as the first social science, the, the first person to apply empirical science to study racism in his study mm -hmm. in uh, Philadelphia in 1896 and 1897. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, was he an inspiration to you, Rod? Oh, oh yeah, I mean, Du Bois is, uh iconic I mean, you know max weber uh 
German sociologist uh, called Du Bois, you know, the greatest American sociologist, you know, at the mm -hmm. time when he was uh, doing his research. Mm -hmm. So he, he's internationally recognized uh, as a scholar and an intellectual uh, giant. It's just unfortunate that um, many social scientists uh, seem to forget that and they ignore him when it comes to uh, really trying to understand the history of, of racism and uh, race, racism and structural racism, you know, mm -hmm. within uh, the U.S. context, let alone within the scientists. So, yeah, yeah definitely an inspiration uh, for me in terms of going, being both a scholar and then uh, a committed activist, you know, mm -hmm. when, you know, the, the Niagara movement, you know, became the NAACP at the turn of the 20th century. I mean, it, there's, there's no way that he couldn't have been an influence and inspiration for me, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, if I hadn't had you on this mm -hmm. uh, talk, let me show you what I would have uh, talked about. I would have talked about, I would have gone into a little bit of detail here about um, this uh, Philadelphia study. This was before he got his first sort of mm -hmm. official appointment as a mm -hmm. professor. Um, and this is the first, what, what is regarded as the first scientific study of an African, uh, sorry, an American black community. Mm -hmm. And he had a hypothesis. He had some methods and the methods were, you know, incredible. What he was trying to do is basically trying to um, understand a, a population of about 40,000 people in, you know, mm -hmm. Philadelphia. I mean, think about the ambition and the mm -hmm. challenge. And it's also important to think about the time, 1896, 1897 was in that decade when basically the Jim, the Jim Crow laws were um, uh, ushering in sort of an apartheid. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so it says it was in this environment of racist terror that Du Bois began the very first scientific study of his people. Mm -hmm. So just, just yeah. an yeah. awesome, towering figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, given his experience and historical context that he operated in, I mean, I can't help but see an obligation, you know, to continue that, that, yeah. that like, you know, so. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But if I can, I'd like to pivot to talk about your work. Um, so your anthropology research, mm -hmm. um, how did you come upon, so your question, how does economic development impact civil society mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. marginalized communities such as African Americans and Puerto Ricans in New England, how did you come upon that question? I, I went to high school in uh, New Britain, uh, Connecticut. It's you know similar to Holyoke, uh, Springfield. You know, um, so my classmates, my 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 friends, my you know my my best friends. Yeah, I mean it was. Yeah, I mean we all grew up together. We were, you know, black Latino communities. Um, I've gotten rusty in some of my Spanish, but you know, um, I mean, we grew up together shared experiences of racism and discrimination and then also a lot of great times. Um, and, and having that experience, having those, that background, you know, I, I wanted to address issues that face my community, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where, where it really comes out of, you know? Got it. So, got it. Got it. Yeah. And um, you had uh, indicated you did some field research. In London, mm -hmm. England. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, what brought you to London? So, as I said, so part of the, the research is on civil society. A lot of that, uh, uh, in terms of not just education, but civic organizations, mm -hmm. um, be it fraternities, sororities, mm -hmm. fraternal organizations such as the Freemasons, um, mm -hmm. particularly uh, the African American Freemasons, uh, Prince Hall. Um, their historic historic experience have been the, the back, background behind founding the first freedom schools here in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, black banks, you know, African Methodist Church, um, those fraternal organizations have had a pivotal role in promoting, uh, promoting and creating black 
in black uh, communities, you know. Um, and as I was doing my research and realizing, you know, what the origin of all these pieces were, it uh, took me to London in the sense that the Prince of Wales chartered the first mm -hmm. African lodge that later became uh, Prince mm -hmm. Hall Lodge. Um, so all the 18th, 19th century archives were actually in London. Mm. So Interesting. The, Interesting. Yeah, so the lodge helped sponsor me uh, to go there to look at the history of uh, Black civil society in, uh, in, in, in London and around the UK. So I was cool. doing a comparative uh, study on the history of those, those institutions and how they promoted actual development you know, mm -hmm. in relationship to civil society. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But eventually, I gather that that sort of triggered, at some point, you were triggered to make a pivot from the scholarship to the on, entrepreneurship in your creation of the Pioneer Valley Coral Natural Science Institute. Yeah, no, definitely I, I was. Uh, and that, that also plays on uh, the privilege I had of, of being a, a PhD candidate and mm -hmm. uh, the community that I was a part of out here in uh, Amherst um, mm -hmm. that afforded me that opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. So, when it uh, presented itself, uh, Lily and I, uh, we were like, yeah, we can actually make a real difference in, yeah. in what, what's happening in the world rather than just researching it and, and dealing with the, the academic hustle and, and politics, you know, no offense yeah. to- No I offense, mean, right. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, given my background and Lily's background, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, we took that opportunity and like, yeah, let's actually do something about it. So, um, and yeah. of course, not to speak for her, um, but just to mention the incredible work that she was doing. Uh, one of the projects they worked on uh, was in uh, Puerto Rico um, with the uh, the groundwater situation there. Uh, yeah. Of the amount of pollutants and uh, from the chemical factories and chemi chem chemical manufacturers. Uh, that are there on the island that uh, have contaminated the, the ground table there, mm -hmm. the water table there. So she wanted to actually do something and bring that research out of the labs and actually try and help communities. So, yeah. you know, when we were able to put the institute together, she was able to do all of her, her research independently and, and develop new ideas and concepts for addressing these pressing issues of, mm -hmm. of water access and and uh, yeah, that's that, yeah. that kind of the motivating factor. To, yeah, cool. to, yeah. That yeah. And that's a actually perfect segue to the last, the final question. Is racism a science problem? Can racism be addressed or solved by the natural sciences? And this is the one in the very beginning of this talk, I said, it's not so obvious that the answer is yes. But as I actually did my own research and I learned about this towering figure in anthropology, Franz, Franz Boas, who was actually probably one of the first maybe white males to suggest the equality of the races. Um, he, instead of the sort of orthogenesis idea of straight line evolution, he had the idea of the fact that culture is important. Seeing um, behavior in the context of culture is important. But what's mm -hmm. fascinating to me is this person got his PhD in physics. <laughs> and yeah. that really tickles me. It makes me wonder whether that background in physics gave him a particular perspective um, mm -hmm. that allowed him to maybe think more objectively. I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it, what it does is it, it makes me think I mean, so we've talked about the idea that racism is insidious and in some cases systemic racism can feel invisible, especially uh, uh, to white people. Um, and it's important that we make the invisible visible. Right. And right. I was thinking that maybe creating, uh, you know, natural scientists are, spend a lot of time making the invisible visible. Think about chemists. You can't see atoms, and yet we find ways to make pictures of molecules all the 
time. So I was thinking that maybe that's a role for the natural sciences to address racism, is making crazy pictures like this one here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it really is a, a, a important aspect for for scientists and the STEMs and chemists like yourself to really like engage these things on such a, a direct uh, way, in such a direct way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanted to put in a plug for an ICOM student, an ICOM's <laughs> graduate class of 2018, uh, here with her family, Janet Wango, who studied race-based race medicine. This is mm -hmm. uh, one of the benefits of ICOM's is as a scientist, you get to study whatever you want, pick whatever problem. And so that's another sort of sense in which the natural sciences can play a role. But as we sort of bring this talk to a close, I wanna really focus on your work and Lily's work at Elatech. And I mm -hmm. wanna ask you, I mean, this is a technology company. How yeah. does this technology company address racism? And, you know, it, it takes more than symbolism, right? I mean, having a, a African-American CEO and, and uh, co-founder along with uh, Lily, the inventor of the technology and uh, chief science officer, it takes a, a, a commitment. And for Elatech, um, we're, we're uh, a socially responsible company in the terms of we give back to the Institute to make mm -hmm. sure that the educational programming are, are going to be there mm -hmm. after this pandemic ends, you know, um, and, and still work with the schools of Holyoke, South Hadley. Um, we want to get down to Springfield, Hartford, and really mm -hmm. engage and support uh, early STEM education for historically marginalized communities like African Americans, Puerto Ricans, the Latino, the Black community, and women um, as a whole. Um, you know, uh, one of the, the great things that uh, Lily was really excited about was all the young women undergrads that she was able to uh, mentor mm -hmm. through the Institute. We had about mm -hmm. 15 uh, young women uh, undergrads from up and down the East Coast, from University of South Florida, all the mm -hmm. way up to Vermont that have interned with her, with, mm -hmm. uh, with, with Lily. Um, so they were so excited about having a, uh, chief science officer as a woman, you know, as I believe right now she's like one of two in the state of Massachusetts. Wow. You know? Yeah, I mean, the numbers are really, really depressing, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and she's an incredible researcher. She's one of the top chemists uh, mm -hmm. in the country, uh, electrochemists in the country. She's, you know, over 50 top uh, publications and, and books and journals and, you know, mm -hmm. Several hundred citations. You know. Sounds like you're a fan. I am. I am. You know. Yeah. So, so what's so what? But what's the sort of the angle of your company? What is what does this company do? Uh, I like to say we're an advanced water treatment company. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if uh, you or some of the folks viewing are familiar with reverse osmosis. Mm -hmm. um, so. What that is, is uh, it uses a uh, high pressure, uh, high water pressure and uh, mm -hmm. membrane to uh, mm -hmm. purify water, to clean water. Um, our system, is, as I said, based off of uh, Lily's research, is utilizes electrochemistry, uh, mm -hmm. electrodes, which she actually uh, invented, you know, and, mm -hmm. and now we've uh, patented uh, the, that technology, where there is no, it's a passive flow through system. Mm -hmm. all in one so unlike reverse osmosis that collects all the contaminants on that membrane it mm -hmm. requires a lot of uh, uh manual maintenance mm -hmm. you know, uh, high energy consumption yeah uh force that water through the membrane our systems uh using the marvels of electrochemistry mm -hmm. you know breaks apart those uh molecules mm -hmm. disperse them and turn them uh inert mm. so gotcha so we reduce and, the operating uh, costs in terms of maintenance uh, up to 80% and mm -hmm. then energy can reduce energy consumption up to 90%. So mm -hmm. we're actually able to operate our systems off grid and we've actually uh, gotten one of our first contracts with a municipal government to install 
at a groundwater pumping station off grid using only solar. So mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So would a place like Fl Flint, Michigan have benefited from this technology? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, we've all yeah, we've been approached by a number of different uh, municipal governments to uh, address mm -hmm. their issues. Um, mm -hmm. But right now with the early stage in which we're at, we're still looking at the FDA process to do drinking water. Um, that's up to a mm. two year process. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. The certificates, but yeah, we, yeah, we are definitely Flint, Michigan could use, use our systems. Yeah, so. got it. Okay. Well, um, Believe it or not, Rod, we're almost at the end. Mm -hmm. um, part three will be to the audience, very brief. Part three is we gave uh, students the opportunity to pose questions to us. And we did, get a, we did get a few questions, many of them very good. And Rod, if it's okay with you, I'd like to share the first two. All right, yeah, go ahead. All right. So, First question, what are examples you've seen in your life of systemic racism and how would you change your reactions to them now? Is that something that you'd be willing to take a swing at? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many examples, I mean, wow. Um, Yeah, again, it's, I, I, I attempted to call names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Let's not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a, I, I think my personality um, has afforded me a certain degree of um, my personality and experience, um, you know, in terms of being Fully, to be fully dis disclose my background. I'm, I'm also ex-military, ex-law mm -hmm. enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I had that, that, that influence and experience that kind of informed mm -hmm. how I react to things. And, mm -hmm. and I use that background and experiences to, to my, my, my advantage, right? You know, like everyone else does, you know? Yeah, um, right, right, exactly. So, so my my reactions generally are, are measured and well thought out. Um, mm. So I I wouldn't necessarily change. Uh, yeah. Well, Interesting. How, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. So. Well, when I saw this question, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a, yeah what What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. When I saw this question, I immediately thought of a page in the book, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson about the criminal justice system that really struck me as a perfect example of systemic or institutional racism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about the Supreme Court attitude on death penalty cases. So I learned from this book that in uh, 1987, the US Supreme Court ruled that introducing evidence about, and I'm just gonna read from the status, yeah. character, reputation, family of a homicide victim was unconstitutional because in principle, all victims are equal. Mm. So they said in 1987, that was unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And it says here, the court prohibited jurors from introducing this arbitrariness into the capital sentencing process because poor victims or victims who are racial uh, minorities didn't have the resources to advocate and the court said that, that, that they shouldn't need to and they struck down this kind, of, um, this kind of evidence. Well, that court decision was widely criticized by prosecutors and politicians. And of course, you know, they were white. <laughs> the prosecutors and the politicians who criticized um, because it took away a tool that they had to incarcerate racial uh, minorities. And under pressure, three years later, the Supreme Court reversed its position. And that opened up the floodgate of death penalty cases for, uh, uh, for racial uh, minorities. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is a textbook example of systemic racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when yeah. I read that, I was really, I was like, wow. 
Mm -hmm. The system is totally rigged. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the profile picture actually that was used for uh, this presentation that we're uh, in the conversation that we're having mm -hmm. um, on the link is uh, from a talk I gave about six years ago on um, school to prison pipeline. You know, looking at the structural racism uh, inherent in in the U.S. justice system and educational system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, again, yeah. so it's like, so it was like, what would you change? I mean, I, I left academia and created my own institutes and, yeah. and now, I'm so that's kind of, that's know, the change. change. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So moving on, um, here are the, la here are two more questions. So what have you done to make sure that all students have access to the honors college and chemistry department resources? That's the first one. And I, I think I'm going to let you swing at the, First part of that one, Rod. Um, well, me, I, as I, I said earlier on, um, I worked with the Honors College and, uh, and wrote the outline for the Emerging Scholars Program, which is the mm -hmm. diversity initiative for the Honors College um, to make sure that more students of color uh, had access to the resources uh, of the university and, mm -hmm. and could work with uh, the different uh, schools and colleges across campus. So I feel that building institutes is kind of my yeah, thing. That's your thing. <laughs> All right. And then, um, so for my part of that, the chemistry part, I can actually share that faculty training is vital for this. Um, mm -hmm. It's essential training in inclusive teaching practices. And we're actually, so I'm going to say that we're actually doing that begin in uh, the beginning of next month. We have an expert, Dr. Brian Dewsbury from uh, Rhode Island is coming to give us some training. And so this is essential. So it's a great question. It's essential that we get this training so that we can kind of win the trust of our mm -hmm. students. Yeah, great. Yep. Great. Yeah, yeah. All right. So Rod, I think we're there at the end. We're at the very end. We made it. The question yeah. is, is racism, is racism a science problem? And I think the answer is, we agree, racism is an everything problem. Right, right. No Definitely. doubt about it. Racism mm -hmm. is all hands on deck, including mm -hmm. science. No exactly. matter what you look like, and no matter what you study, and no matter what you do, mm -hmm. all hands on deck. We all have to do our part, yeah. Indeed. So with that, we've reached the end. I just want to thank you, Rod, for taking the time today and the time this week on all the prep to get ready for this. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity. And again, you know, you know uh, I really appreciate it that uh, Dean Constantetta uh, yeah. put, put us together, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. thank you to the Commonwealth Honors College. Thank you for all the students who made it to the end. And we ask you to please Stay safe. All right. Okay. Watch your hands. Wear a mask. <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right.